We have a special treat for you as we begin our worship today. Our kids' musical this past Friday night entitled The Born Again Identity was presented by these young people right here and about 80 more. We had about 100 kids up on the stage, and a lot of those kids are community kids that go to other churches and have other schedules this morning, maybe vacations and stuff, other churches. But we were grateful that these kids came this morning to sing for us. Uh, Becky Gallant was our camp leader this week, and Tisha Walker helped with the choreography and did the choreography. Can we help uh, thank these two ladies for the work that they did this week? <laughs> Becky and Tisha, thank you. A lot of work was put into this. Many other people helped uh, with that. Thank you for all your help this week. These kids are going to sing two of the songs from the musical, The Born Again Identity, and this one's called I Believe, and then we'll be followed by Upon the Cross, and the soloist is Hannah Wildman. I believe what I read in John 3.16. I believe God sent his son for you and me. I believe Jesus died to set us free. I believe, I believe, I believe. I believe what I read in John 3.16. I believe, I believe, I believe. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. I believe what I read in John. 3.16 I believe God sent his son for you and me I believe Jesus died to set us free I believe I believe I believe For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life for god so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life i believe what i read in john 3 16. i believe god sent his son for you and me i believe Jesus died to set us free. I believe, I believe, I believe. I For believe so the world I read and that don't he gave his one and only son. son. I that believe that believes in God him and his son shall for not you perish, and me have eternal life. I For believe so the world Jesus died to that set us one free. And only son. I believe that whoever I believe in him.
and forgiveness. Joy came at such a cost. There is grace because of Jesus' death upon the cross. Amen. Amen. That's just a taste of what they were part of this week. We appreciate these kids. These kids are going to come out and join their parents now as we all stand together and sing about the one that they've been singing about, the solid rock, Jesus Christ, our Lord. is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is King said, Hallelujah. When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, no other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. His oath, His covenant, His blood support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, He then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, no other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Shall come with trumpet sound. Oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground. His sinking sand, all Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground. His sinking sand, all other ground. His sinking Amen. We 
praise Him today. We are here this morning to worship and bow down as Psalm 95 says, Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for He is our God. And we are the people of His pasture, the sheep under His care. And His Son, Jesus, for this reason, God highly exalted Him, gave Him the name above every name, so that the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. That's what we're here to do today, to worship the Father today. Would you sing with us? Here I am to worship. Worship him today, Lord. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see Beauty that made this heart adore you Hope of a life spent with you So here I am to worship Here I am to bow down Here I am to say You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. The King of all days, oh so highly exalted, glorious in heaven above. Humbly you came to the earth you created, all full of sin became poor. So here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy. singing 
Amen, church. Thank you so much. Please be seated. Thank you. to uh, vote on our annual budget. Um, there's just a lot of things that we get to celebrate tonight. Um, and that's the way that we view our members' meetings here at Brainerd. It's a, it's a time of celebration, to celebrate the things that God has done over, over the past year. So please, please, please be here tonight if you can. Um, it'll be a great time for you to be here. Uh, second thing, um, if you're not a member and you hear this word membership being thrown around Brainerd a lot, um, Good thing is we got something for you too. It's called our Membership Matters class. Uh, it is a two-part class. Um, the, the upcoming one that we have is August 9th and 16th. Um, so, but just for clarification, attending this class does not automatically make you a member, but it does let you know the ins and outs, the DNA of how Brainerd works, what we're about. Um, so it'd be a good opportunity for you to come to see what Brainerd's about so you can start thinking through more clearly the membership process if that's something that God's putting on your heart to become a member here at Brainerd. And then finally, uh, Promotion Sunday and Midweek Services. Um, August 13th is the day that uh, all of our grade-based ministries, so kids, students, and even college, uh, we move up in grade. Um, so for some of you, that means uh, you have kids in the kids' ministry and you're moving from one classroom to another for some of you. That means uh, you have kids moving into the student ministry for the first time, so you'll be moving not just classrooms, you'll be moving entire buildings. Um, so that Sunday is August 13th, and the reason why we say that is so that uh, your, your, uh, your kids won't be in the wrong room on that Sunday, among other reasons. Uh, and then August 23rd, all, all of our midweek activities will be starting back, so Wednesday night, all of our kids, students, uh, all of our adult midweek classes, they will all be starting back. Um, so make sure to be looking on our uh, events page, on our calendar, um, wherever we have it online, uh, just to see what you could be uh, involving yourself in, what you could be getting to be a part of uh, this coming fall. Uh, as we prepare to move in the next part of our worship service, if, if you came uh, prepared to give this morning, there's many ways that you can do that. There's a blue box uh, in the back where you came in. Um, you can give online. Uh, you can even mail your check to the church. You can come drop it by personally if you want to. There's plenty of ways that you can give to Brainerd. Um, so let's pray for our offering as we move to the next part of our uh, worship service. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you. Thank you so much for this day, this opportunity you've given us to come here, worship corporately, um, to be together as the body of Christ, to celebrate you and who you are, to learn from you this morning, God. Um, bless our offering that it be uh, an act of worship that we all see that we get to be a part of, to be a part of uh, furthering your kingdom, God. Um, and as we move into the uh, further part of this worship service, God, that we hear from your word, that you make your word perfectly clear to us, that you have our hearts and our minds ready to receive what you have for us to learn this morning, God, so that it can impact our lives and uh, we can further glorify you and your kingdom by the way that we work. We love you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Brainerd family. Brainerd family, it is so exciting to be able to sit here right now and to be able to reflect upon God's faithfulness at Brainerd, North Georgia these last five years. And it's incredible to think that it has been five years that we're gonna be able to say God has put Brainerd, North Georgia there at Cloud Springs. You know, and when I think about God's faithfulness, I can't help but to see how he has helped Brainerd, North Georgia not only flourish, but further his purposes in and through Brainerd, North Georgia. We have seen so many things flourish at Brainerd, North Georgia, from our kids' ministry just blossoming and growing where now we've nearly taken 
almost all of our classes up at Brainerd North Georgia for us to be able to reach students and care for students and be able to share the Bible with students. And so that means volunteers are there and students are hearing and kids are hearing about everything. Our student ministry has started to flourish in and of itself. Our attendance has flourished in itself. We've seen life groups flourish and people getting in them and connected in so many different ways. It has been nothing short of just encouraging to see God continue to work in his people to see his church there at Brainerd, North Georgia flourish. And what's more is we haven't just simply sit, been sitting idly by. We have been doing what we can to further his purposes around our community and even into the nations. And so what that means is that we have seen people go out and serve the community, whether it's been at the schools or whether it's been through other ministries that we have been able to reach out and use to be able to reach the community, such as getting backpacks and giving them to the schools filled with all the different things that students need in these schools to be able to help them be blessed, to making connections with other ministries around the area for the furtherance of the gospel, to also seeing people be deployed into not only the community, but also into the nations. All of those things have been nothing short of a testimony of God's faithfulness to not only see his congregation there flourish, but to also see his people be mobilized in the area for his honor and for his glory. I have been so blessed to be able to see all that God has been doing, and I can't help but to pray for what God will do in these next five years. And I am thankful for all that he's done. And I hope that you can come alongside and celebrate with all of us on July 30th at Brainerd North Georgia as we celebrate all that he has done for his honor and for his glory. family and so I hope uh, you'll be able to attend that's next Sunday. Also uh, what a way to begin our service right hearing those kids sing and hearing them sing specifically about the cross that I, I can't imagine a better way to start this Sunday morning and so uh, parents thanks for getting your kids here even grandparents got their kids here so many workers I and mean, there are 40 plus workers that invested a lot of hours this week and uh, I just feel very, very blessed to have seen it in action all week long, and um, I'm glad we got to have a little, little taste of that today in our worship service. It is good to be back. Some of you know I was gone a couple weeks. I was gone for a vacation one week, and then last Sunday I was at our East Ridge campus and got to see firsthand what the Lord's doing there. Uh, it is good to be back, though, today with you. This morning we will be uh, observing our, our Lord's Supper, and so uh, hopefully you were able to pick up uh, some of the elements as you came in. Uh, if not, feel free to get that. If you're a believer, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, we want you to participate. We want you to remember the body of Christ broken for us, the blood of Christ shed for us. If you have your Bibles, could you take them and turn to Ephesians 4? So we're going to continue our series in Ephesians, and you know this. You know this, right? All of the Bible matters. All of it is God-breathed. And I don't want to be overly dramatic, but I, I do want to tell you there are um, a small handful of passages that I really do think could change the way you understand what church is all about. So again, all of the Bible matters. There are a few passages that I think if, we, if you really caught what the Lord was saying, it may change how you view church. If your idea of church basically amounts to it being, um, and I don't know that anybody would ever verbalize it this way, but if you think it may amount to a religious club or a place where you just kind of get emotionally charged up, you get some spiritual energy, a place where you can go and feel a little bit better about yourself, a place where you can attend when it's convenient, a place where you might find some friends, get validation, and there's not a lot of meaningful connection or meaningful relationships, then I actually believe God may surprise you today with how, what he designed, what his intention was, how he communicates about the church. And so we're going to read Ephesians 4. I'm going to begin reading in verse 7, and we'll read to verse 16. I hope you have a copy of God's Word. 
Now grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. For it says when he ascended on high, he took the captives captive and he gave gifts to people. But what does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower parts of the earth? And the one who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens to fill all things. Verse 11, and he himself gave some to be apostles and some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, equipping the saints for the work of ministry to build up the body of Christ until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of God's Son, growing into maturity with a, with a stature measured by Christ's fullness. Then we will no longer be little children tossed by every wind of teaching, by human cunning with cleverness and the techniques of deceit, but speaking the truth in love, let us grow in every way into him who is the head, Christ. From him, the whole body, fitted and knit together by every supporting ligament, promotes the growth of the body for building up itself in love by the proper working of each individual part. We're in chapter 4. We don't have time to review all of Ephesians, but this passage, this passage that we just read doesn't appear out of thin air. It rests on a foundation. And if, if you get anything from Ephesians, one of the things you're supposed to get from Ephesians is that Jesus is in an exalted place, which that needs to be said because we serve a, a crucified Messiah, someone that was crucified, executed as a common criminal, but he rose from the dead and he is not that common criminal any longer. He has ascended, he is ruling, he is in charge, he's authoritative, and he is over everything in heaven and earth. And Ephesians hits that drumbeat again and again and again, even in this passage. But it hits another, another drumbeat. As you read through the book of Ephesians, it's not just that Jesus is exalted, but as he is exalted, he is bringing all things together especially his people, his church, his body. He's bringing us together in himself. That's why last week, Pastor Kevin shared really about the oneness. There's one faith and one baptism and one spirit and one God and one Father of us all, one hope we're called to. All that emphasis on one, 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 because he is bringing us together. Even the passage that you looked at last week talks about maintaining the unity, again, bringing People that are very different, see the world very differently, have different personalities, different wirings, different backgrounds, come together as one. Let's keep that in mind. Jesus is exalted and he's bringing all things together because we're going to see that even unfold. This passage starts reminding us that since he's exalted, verses 7 and 8, you, you get a very clear picture that Jesus in his exalted state gives gives special grace gifts to each individual. Jesus as exalted, we sang about it a moment ago, king of all days, so highly exalted. In his exalted state, he gives gifts, special grace gifts to each individual. Look at verse 7. Now grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. And the end of verse 8, for he gave gifts to people there's this interesting connection, and you need to know this connection. When you read in verse, verse 8 there, it says, for it says, and it's a reference. So some of you have like those little notes in your Bible, and they take you back to like, oh, the cross-reference for this would be Psalm 68. So most of what you read in verse 8 is a quotation of Psalm 68. It takes you back. Well, what is Psalm 68 about? It is about the Lord being victorious and reigning setting enemies down and taking charge and ruling. And, and when, you, when you win, we have a phrase. In English, we say, you know, to the victor belongs the spoils. If you win, you get to assume everything. You, get to, you, you receive things. You, you gain some things because you won. But it's interesting what is done in verse 8. 
Because Paul is quoting Psalm 68, verse 18, about ascending. But he changes the word. I don't think he's misquoting Psalms. I think he intentionally changes a word. And Psalm says that the king receives gifts, but Paul changes it. Notice in verse 8, he says, the king doesn't just receive the gifts, he actually gives the gifts. So this one who reigns, this one who has conquered, t- taking captives, captivity captive, the one who rules, c- accumulates all these things. But this passage says Jesus, in winning everything, gives. He gives it away. He gives grace to each one of us. That theme fits Ephesians so well. Well, yeah, he did receive all. But Ephesians would tell you in Ephesians 1 and verse 6, grace was lavished on us. Verse 7, verse 8, the riches of his grace, he pours out on us and richly pours out on us. So as much as Jesus ascends and could accumulate everything, receive all praise and honor and gifts, and to the winner belongs the spoils, he actually turns around and gives it. He gives gifts. God is a giving God. And that that gift isn't a small gift. It's according to the measure. He gives gifts to each. He gives grace to each individual. And here's the measure. Here's the standard. Here's the measuring stick. He does it according to the measure of Christ's gift for us. What is that? That is an awesome gift according to the generous supply. Paul would say in another place, this is an indescribable gift. So according to that measure, the one who can give indescribable gifts, he gives to each individual. Grace upon grace upon grace. He gives gifts to everyone. That scope, everybody, each person receives grace. Each person receives a gift. Jesus' grace gift. And we need to hear this. Jesus' gifts aren't for the elite. They're not just for the educated, the rich, the powerful. It isn't just for those who are mature, theologically trained, those who are, you know, there's always the cool kids. They're everywhere. And it's not just for a certain isolated group. That This says God's grace is for everyone. Everyone, grace for the ones who have, who walked in those doors, who have the sketchy past, the ones who have the broken family, the ones who have chronic pain, the one who perpetually you felt like you're the misfit, the one who has crippling anxiety, the one who is an abuse survivor. He gives grace to each one. The heartbroken widow, the one who's navigated a world with dyslexia, the one who's battled addiction, the one who's person, the, the person living paycheck to paycheck, grace goes to each individual. The scope is pretty stunning. Those with eating disorders, those with disabilities, blue collar, white collar, retired, yet to be working. I mean, God gives these grace gifts and he pours it out. And the pre-qualification is you are in Christ. So you get the gift. You get grace. Part of ruling for Jesus is giving what you don't deserve looks at a body like us, undeserving sinners like us, and he gives us grace. He came to the earth to give grace to even individuals, and then we meet together as a community, and this is what I know about you. If you're in Christ, he's given you grace. He's given you a special gift. Where was all this headed? I mean, what did he have in mind? So he doles out all this grace. He doles out all, this, all these gifts. You actually keep reading. In verse 9 and 10, there's a little bit of a a logic exercise. So verse 9 says, we're talking about Jesus ascending, but what does he ascended mean except that he also descended? So Jesus, you know, from eternity past has this rule and reign in heaven, but then he he descends and then ascends. What does it mean that he descends? It says here he descends to the lower parts of the earth. And uh, just to tell you, there are probably millions of pages about what does it mean that he descended to the lower parts of the earth. There's all kinds of theories. Google it all afternoon and you won't be bored, I promise, of what does it mean the lower parts of the earth. My best understanding of this is he descended to the lower parts, which are the earth. Oh, he descended. I mean, what descent is it when you are at the the throne room of heaven and you come to this earth? Humbly, we sang it a moment ago, humbly he came to the earth he created came to this earth. 
He walked among sinners. He took on a human body with all its limitations. And then he was executed. He descended to be killed. He descended to the grave. He knows what it's like to have a very human experience, and he identified with all humans. Why did he descend to the earth? This passage tells us. So that he could fill all things. And if my understanding is right, he already filled heaven, right? He's the one who fills the heavens. But Jesus came to this earth, gathered a group, an assembly of believers. His first believers weren't that spectacular. They ran out. They denied him. They said they didn't know him. But he assembled this group of believers, and he rescued them from the kingdom of darkness and transferred them to the kingdom of light. And over time, he works a change in them, in us, so that we would look more like him. And then it's not as if he just does that. He also gives us a commission. He sends us to spread out, share good news, create communities that fill the earth so that wherever true churches are, Jesus is present on this earth. I thought about, thought about when I read this, I thought about a few weeks ago. So we had, in, in last month, we took a little trip, real quick trip up to the Northeast. And it was right after the, a lot of the Canadian wildfires. And so we were driving up into Virginia and, and Maryland, and you began, to, you began to see, like, it almost like sepia, if you know what I mean, like kind of that filter. You're looking through everything, and it's brown, and it's hazy, and you can't see that far. And because it's like the whole sky was filled with this haze, the smoke, the smog. And I thought about Jesus filling everything. Well, that's the air filled, but, but imagine this. I thought... I pictured followers of Jesus Christ today, maybe have already met, maybe yet to meet, all over this earth, different languages, different ethnicities and nations, different skin tones, different, different features. And they met and they sang about Jesus. And all over this world, multiple continents, all kinds of countries, all kinds of people groups, the earth was filled Earth was filled with Jesus. He is filling all things. Does it not change how you see church? If this is just, yeah, it's where I go on Sunday morning most times when I can make it. No, church is filling all things. This is his design, giving grace gifts to each individual. And we'll come back to that because he gives gifts to each individual. And we're going to look at that even more. But without diminishing anything of the work He's doing in each individual. I also want you to notice as Jesus is exalted, he gives specific appointments to some. So we notice that he gives grace gifts to every individual. But this passage, especially in verse 11, says he gives specific appointments to some. Part of the victory of Jesus is how he's going to care for his church, and he's going to care for his church with specific appointments, and all of them are going to relate really to the Word and caring for God's Word being communicated to God's people. So look what it says in verse 11, and he, emphasis here, he himself gave some to be apostles and some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. A couple times in Ephesians, you encounter this idea of apostles and prophets. Who are they? They're the ones that really gave the foundational revelation. So, I mean, we have a Bible. We have 27 books in our New Testament. We can go, and, and it's nice collated. It's bound. It's like we have references and cross-references, but all those early churches, they, they might have a scroll here and a scroll there, and they needed to know, what does Jesus want from his church? And there were apostles, and there were prophets speaking into that. Here's what God wants. Here's how the church is going to be organized. Here's what it means to live like Christ, and they're apostles and prophets giving that foundational revelation. That's a gift we, we benefit from the gift. We're reading from Apostle Paul, and we can read from Apostle Peter and Apostle Matthew and Apostle John. We have the teaching that we're still benefiting from, specific appointment. He gives apostles and prophets, but he also gives evangelists. What are those? The best I understand it, it has to do with movement. It's God's word going out, church planners, missionaries, taking the gospel forward, good news spreaders, taking what Jesus has done and telling it to where people haven't heard. People don't know this is a gift to the church. 
And then there are these communities that form and there are gatherings with kind of they, they settle down and, and who's going to look after the communities of Jesus? And there are pastors and teachers. Most of, most of you would even know those, those words kind of go together, even in the way it's written in the original languages. They go together, pastor, teacher. I don't know if it's separate offices. I'm more inclined to think it's pastors and how do pastors pass? They teach, they communicate God's word. But however you read it, you, you sense God. God's word being used to take care of his people. But what is the gift for? So he gives apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, pastors, teachers. Verse 12, you read this, it's to equip saints for the work of ministry. Equip saints, all all of us, for the work of ministry, to build up the body of Christ. Their works of ministry, it's just it kind of become a, a, a church word for just works of service. Meeting needs, taking care of people, meeting, helping those, caring for someone deeply, works of service. You know what, I mean, there's an infinite variety of those, aren't there? I mean, there, there are times where you just, your presence is a work of service because you were there. Someone felt like their burden got a little bit lighter someone cared, a work of service. Some of you brought groceries to someone. Some of you looked after someone in need this week. Some of you helped get another another person to an appointment that they couldn't get there themselves. Casseroles, gift cards, handicap ramps, free babysitting, listening to someone unload their burdens, works of service. I love reading that this week. Because I think my week last Sunday started at Eastridge, our campus there. I saw Pastor Carlos faithfully shepherding and equipping our brothers and sisters at Eastridge. And then this week, all week long, Monday to Friday, I got to see volunteers and they had different gifts and different skills and they worked in different ways. I saw 40 plus at music camp in different ways, doing works of service, caring for other people's kids, loving them, letting that kid know you matter, teaching them, I mean, teaching them some things that may stick with them, maybe helping them develop things that otherwise they wouldn't develop. And then downstairs, many of you know, we hosted a couple hundred world changers. And I saw, I saw an army of volunteers of our church family show up, cooking food, prepare it, serving, cleaning up. And then Wednesday, we have, this was our week for the food pantry in which over 100 people, 100 families represent, probably a couple hundred, 300 people represented in those that came. We gave food, and that food went to people that are in need. And they needed to know it isn't just a handout. It, it was delivered with care and love. We prayed with the majority of the people that come in. We have an opportunity to pray with them. Pastor Carlos even got to lead one of the people that came to Jesus Christ. So I think of all the works of service, and this is, this is the job description for pastors and teachers to equip the saints. I feel in some ways this week it was just for me to keep up with the saints doing the work of the ministry, not to equip, but just to encourage and to cheerlead. And all that was just on site. I don't know what else happened. I don't know where else works of service were done in Christ's name, where in your job, in your home, in your community, for your family, for stranger you, you loved and you served. This builds up the body. It's for the equipping the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body. What is that building up? And I think the idea is something that's sturdy and durable, something that is functional, it works, like the body's working, it's built up, it's, it's going to last, and it's, it's even beautiful. The pastors of this church have an appointment, a specific appointment to serve that. How, how do we help the body? That's, that's the pastor's mission. How do we help the body to be more functional? How does this church last, not as a museum, but as a movement of the gospel. How do we reflect more and get stronger at showing the beauty of the love of God? And God, this is what leaves me so surprised, is that God entrusts his treasured possession to flawed human beings. 
So some of you are going to say, if I heard right, the, Curtis said that pastors are a gift. So is he saying that he is God's gift to the church? <laughs> That's not exactly what I mean in that way. Actually, I read this and I think, in some ways, we're meant to be unimpressed with the container. We're, we're stewards, we're servants, we're shepherds, we're teachers. And it, like, listen, you get to know me long enough. Some of you know me well, some of you not so much. You live long enough and, and like, all of us, like, you're unimpressed with people. Like, they're just people, Right? So God chooses people, people, like, and this isn't, I, I promise this isn't false humility, but even this week I've run into limits and insecurities and personality flaws and shortcomings and stubborn sins. And I think, Lord, you, I know beyond a shadow of doubt you've given me a specific appointment to equip these saints for works of service, to build up the body of Christ, that's why I pray, like, Lord, help, because I know the end game, because I, I keep reading, and I read the end game here. Verse 13 is like, we labor the gifts that God's given, specific appointments. We labor until we all reach unity in the faith, in verse 13, until we all reach, like, knowledge of God's Son, growing into maturity with a stature measured by Christ's fullness. Unity of faith, unity of knowledge, together we, like, it's not just about me getting, it's not about you getting all this massive knowledge. It's about us coming together and understanding like, collectively what if every single person in the room, what if every person that called Brainerd home had a unity, had a unity of like, we really know the truth. We really know who Jesus is. We grow in our knowledge of him. We experience the powerful presence of the Son of God. Have you ever like imagine you and I are talking and we have this person that I've known for a long time and you've just met and imagine you've met him and you go, wow, they just seem like such a nice person, such carefree. And you've met him one time and you don't really know him. But I go like, you don't really know him, do you? You don't really, they're, they're kind of tough to live with. But you've met him that one time. I, I fear when I hear people talk about, you know, I like to think of Jesus as, or, you know, my Jesus is a, and, and they kind of fill in the blank with all sorts of interesting things, but it's like if you get the knowledge of the Son of God wrong, it's eternally devastating. We don't get to fill in the blanks of what we like to think of Jesus as. We pursue truth, and we get united, and, and I listen to you, and you listen to me, and we grow in our knowledge, and we grow in our understanding so that we go, that's who Jesus is. That's exactly who he is. This is exactly what he wants from us. We are, we are growing into maturity with a stature measured by Christ's fullness. I think Pastor Kevin last week talked about, like, it is that picture. And I saw even some pictures this week of our own kids when they were little wearing, like, my clothes or wearing Shauna's clothes. And they, they don't quite fit into it. But one day, like, well, now my son's taller than I am. So... It's like he's grown into, like, full measure. And I think, what does it mean to, like, we grow into the full measure of Christ together? Like, we really do look like him. We look more and more like him. And verse 14 says, the other side of that is we don't want to be children any longer, tossed and blown around by every wind of teaching. So the goal here is that the work of the pastors here would equip so that we're not, we're not infants anymore, which is a little bit of a challenge because there are new believers in our, in our presence. And you have to meet new believers. You have to meet those that are maybe immature in their faith. You meet them where they are. Everybody has to start somewhere, right? So you're trying to help them grow, but not stay there. So we're always doing work to try to push people to maturity so that we're not, we're not blown around so that there's like some stability to our faith that we're not blown around by every bit of teaching, which I'll tell you, that is very, very hard in this day when you can, you can spend the rest of your day just, and YouTube will serve it up one link after another after another with all kinds of teaching. And some of it might be true, and a lot of it may be off the wall. And there's, so there's an exposure. I mean, we're all exposed to all kinds of things, all sorts of voices in our ear teaching. And 
Is it just going to like knock you down, blow you every which way, get you all ramped up about something you shouldn't get ramped up about? How do we, like we, we lean into equipping in such a way where you're not deceived, which that's a challenging task as well. Uh, I had the unfortunate experience of walking into a Barnes & Noble religious section. I thought, my goodness, if my brothers and sisters in Christ, if a new believer walks into this section labeled like Christianity, there's so much nonsense there. Like, how do we just, we've just got a week in, week out labor in God's Word, try to, try to create a community where we're all like attentive to God's Word so that we're not blown around, so that we're not tricked by this person selling this thing and this person selling this thing. It is a challenge, but Jesus appoints this awesome task to give some responsibility. We started off thinking about each individual gets God's grace and there's specific appointments for the good of the body. But, but I also now, I want you to see in verse 15, he, he, he also gives a significant assignment to everyone. So he gives this significant assignment to everyone, and it's in verse 15, speaking the truth in love, let us grow in every way into him who is the head, Christ. What is that specific assignment given to everyone, even the 16-year-old believer here, the 12-year-old believer, the 85-year-old believer? It is speaking the truth in love, communicating the truth in love. Everyone's included, whether you feel like you're super qualified or more like a novice. It isn't just pastors that are meant to speak the truth in love. It's everybody. By the way, the word speaking is more, more like communicating, so it's speaking, acting, doing, spreading the truth. If there was a word in English like truthing in love, that would be probably even a better way to say it. It's just like your whole life is given in truth, communicating that truth in love. And we don't always do that well. We don't always do that well. We, we, sometimes we get so cold and apathetic and we just don't really care about other people. Or maybe we've been burned and we're cynical and we just, we decide, you know what, I'm going to play it pretty close to the vet. I'm not going to get invested in anybody's lives. I'm going to keep it pretty tight here. And the church misses out you, you speaking the truth in love. Or sometimes we think we're communicating some version of love, but we weasel out on the truth. Maybe it's because we don't know it. Maybe we feel like it'll upset somebody. Maybe we're too much of a people pleaser. And so we don't tell people the truth and we just kind of politely nod or go, well, you just, you do you. It'll be all be okay, I'm sure. But then sometimes it's actually the opposite. We convince ourselves, no, I'm, I'm a truth teller. Everybody knows me. I'm a truth teller. But in the end, it's hard to draw any straight line. But with what you say and your attempts to speak the truth and, and any sort of sacrificing, self-giving love that the Bible is all about for the good of others. Frankly, sometimes in our thinking, well, I'm a truth teller, we're actually more of a know-it-all or a, or a bully. It's not easy to get this right, but what if, what if we were so committed to the, the good of others that like Jesus, people walked away from encounters with us knowing that we would bleed for them. We would sacrifice for their good. We only want what's best for them. What if they heard the truth and all of its wisdom and beauty and goodness? What if they heard it clearly, not just kind of a, I just tell people the brutal facts, but what if they heard the, actually the loving, intentional facts that could make you better and more like Christ? What if we didn't hold back, but we kept pressing in? You say, well, how do I do that for everybody? Okay, well, well maybe you can't do it for everybody, but what, what about a few that God would put in your path this week? The amazing result in the end of verse 15 and verse 16 is we grow in every way into him. And I don't know anatomy and physiology well enough to even venture into all this, but it says every supporting ligament, it is fits, it's knit together. The body's working Every organ, every member, every part of the body is working properly. The whole body, actually, when it's working properly, all the joints, all the ligaments, it's actually building itself up in love. So I just have to ask. We can read all this, but are you that connected? I mean, we read about, like, ligaments and joints knitted, fit together. Are you that connected with people in this body? What does that look like for you? Are you so connected that others would, would miss you? if you weren't engaged. And maybe it doesn't look like it looked 20 or 30 years ago. Maybe it doesn't look like what it looked like two years ago. Maybe you have all kinds of additional responsibilities and burdens. 
But if you weren't here, would our body keep functioning as if you were because you wouldn't be missed? Or are you that ligament joint connected to a group and we're all getting stronger because you're connected? You know, of course, I want that. I want Brainerd to be more than just a place I I want to be connected like that. Maybe you say, well, where do I start? Well, maybe step one would be praying about it. Maybe step two would be a conversation about that of like, you know, I used to be more connected. I'm not. I used to be connected ligaments and joints and every part working together. I used to be that, but I'm not. Maybe you have a conversation with another sister or brother. Maybe, maybe you have a discussion with the pastor. We'd love to have that discussion. Another, like, serious question this brings is, are you in any way speaking the truth and love to people close to you on a regular basis? Did, where did that happen this week? Speaking the truth in love. Can you point to conversations where you verbalized or received God's word from other believers? Truthful words spoken in love. Did that happen? Is it happening? If not, where could you start? You need to grow in your knowledge? Let's work on that. Are you... Are you telling yourself some false narrative, giving yourself excuses? Are you saying, I'm, I'm way underqualified to ever share God's word? No, no, you have the spirit of God in you. Every part of this body can be speaking the truth in love to each other. I benefited from that this week. This body, members of this body speaking the truth in love to me. And I want you to benefit from that as well. I hope you can understand why this passage means so much to me. I'm pretty consumed. I feel like it's a responsibility to do what I can to make sure we are, as a body, equipped for works of service. And, and we're praying, like, Lord, help us break it down. I, I know it's a big church. I know there's a lot going on. How can we do it in such a small way, in small pieces where every individual knows, like, you matter. What if 5% more of our church discovered individually? They have an assignment. Speak the truth. What if instead of just, just being about ourselves, we, we were using God's gift that he gave us individually, but collectively we're a part of something that's far bigger than all of us individually? What if we were that united and cohesive community? What if the contributions of each individual, we saw those as valuable, but there's still like this unity of purpose and it extends your Brainerd, Hamilton County, throughout the world, extending the rule of King Jesus. So we need to wrap up. We're going to take the Lord's Supper in a moment. But that's, this is a beautiful day, not just a tack on the Lord's Supper. This is a beautiful day to remember that individually, we all come level. We all come, each individually, having received grace from God. So we're all going to take that. There's no VIP section. We're all VIPs. We're all deeply loved. We're all welcomed if you're a follower of Jesus Christ. I want you to experience that welcome. But we take it together against, as a church. We press against individualism. I'm not taking this Tuesday afternoon in my office. I'm taking it with you, my brothers and sisters in Christ. We're all coming individually, but we're coming collectively to say we are the body of Christ. I'd like to do this. Can we just take a moment and prepare our hearts? I, I hate to go in just kind of prayers of praise. Let's take a moment and do that. And then in just a moment, I'll lead us in actually taking the elements. Church, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and, and his apostles were gathered around him, much like we're gathered here together, and he broke that bread. And he told them, this is my body, it's broken for you. I want you to do this in remembrance of me. In remembrance of him, we take it. You could take the juice. Jesus also said, 
passing a cup around, he said, this cup is a new covenant, a new covenant that would be sealed with his blood. And he told them to drink this in remembrance of me. In remembrance of him, we drink. Our kids began our service today singing about the cross. We take the Lord's Supper and proclaim the Lord's death again until he comes. In a moment, we're going to sing a song that's a prayer. So a lot of, a lot of our songs that we sing are prayers. This one is like, take my life, open-handed to the Lord, take my life and let it be. Can, can I pray that the Lord would um, use what we've read today and that if you're struggling finding like, what is my role, what is my part? that God would speak to your heart and give you clarity of what your next step should be. Let me, let me pray for us. Father, what a privilege it's been to look in your word. What a privilege it is to open the bread and open the juice and remind ourselves with these small elements that is very common of something extraordinary, and that is we are called by your name. We'll never know what it's like to be outside your kingdom. We're thankful for your spirit that unites us and even as where it would be so easy to be divided and torn apart and really ripped to shreds, um, you are bringing us together and you brought us together around bread and juice that points us to your sacrifice. So we do ask, Lord, take our lives. Take what we have. Take our moments. Take our days. Take our limits Take our disabilities and insecurities. Take our weaknesses. Take our liabilities. Take our best efforts and our best intentions and use those in a way that makes your name look great. We ask it for the glory of Jesus and in his name. Amen. I invite you to stand. Let's worship.
continue the gospel through our mission here at Brainerd Baptist Church. Thank you, Pastor Curtis. This evening, don't forget, it's another chance for us to come together in fellowship and learn about ministries and see how God is moving through the different parts of our church throughout all the campuses. Right here at 5 o'clock, we invite you to be back here for our uh, annual budget and uh, approval and a lot of great things that Pastor Curtis is going to share that the Lord has laid on his heart today. We leave you today with the same blessing we always do every week. Psalm 67, 1 and 2, may God be gracious to you and bless you. May he make his face to shine upon you so that his way may be known on the earth and his salvation among all the nations. Church, we love you. Go in peace. Have a great week.